All right. Uh, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I'll try not to wander too much. Um, so excited to be here and see so many familiar faces in the room. My wife's sitting over here, by the way. She's the real star of the show. That's Marcy. Yeah. <laughs> So um, she's here to make sure of the accuracy of what I talk about today. So I'm very excited to be here for a few reasons, but primarily um, I'm just, I love doing what I do at Methodist Dallas Medical Center. And I don't want to take for granted um, that you all that are here today or people that you might know in the community know how much our staff and our doctors love taking care of patients. Um, I'll try not to make this too much of a Methodist Dallas commercial, but it's in my blood, it's in my DNA, so get ready, all right, buckle up, all right? Um, but I will be done at some point, so uh, you can look forward to that. But, um, you know, Methodist Dallas, we get patients from across the nation and uh, that come to Methodist Dallas because of the expertise of our doctors across many service lines. We're actually international now, if you consider Puerto Rico international, do we? Okay. So we have, um, because we, we've trained doctors for years, we have doctors from Puerto Rico that came to Methodist Dallas for their nephrology fellowship. Now they've gone back home. They've been there long enough where um, we now have two clinics, one in Mayaguez and one in San Juan, Puerto Rico, where we see patients for kidney transplants. So we see them there. They come here to Dallas, have their kidney transplant, stay right here in our community for about a month or so, six weeks after their transplant and go back home. So it's so neat that we get to impact uh, people from so far away. What our staff really loves is taking care of our neighborhood, right here, right in our back door. So please don't tell our Puerto Rico patients they might be second to <laughs> our backyard patients, but we love taking care of Oak Cliff and Dallas. So um, I hope you feel that come out today and you know um, how much we, we love our communities. Um, Make sure I get there we go. Okay, so here is my card. Okay, so this is my cell phone number, and it's always in my pocket or close to me, and it's on my card as well. So I'm going to leave these here, and um, I hope you take one, and I hope you keep it with you. Um, Methodist Dallas, I want to be your easy button for if you have someone at our hospital at Methodist Dallas, and you want someone to check on them, or if you have someone at our hospital and they tell you, you won't believe the great care that I'm getting. I want to go find them in our hospital and because it keeps me around our staff, I love seeing our staff light up whenever our patients are telling them how great of an experience they're having. Um, so please use me as your healthcare easy button, okay, for Methodist Dallas or just healthcare in general. If you or someone that you know have a question about something related to healthcare, give me a call on my cell phone. If I don't pick up, I'll call you right back. You can text me. Lexi, um, who is here, she's our Director of Community Relations also. She's a get-her-done type person. Um, so together, we'll make sure to take care of y'all, okay? All right, so um, I've been told every good talk has objectives. All right, so here we go. So objective number one, accomplished. I've always, since I've been here at Methodist Dallas for four years, wanted to talk at Texas Talk. So here we go, right? Woo! Yes, thank you, thank you. All right. Um, number two, I want you all to get to know a little bit about me because that's important to me. If you all know who's the president of Methodist Dallas, I hope that makes you feel better about your hospital and your community. And what excites me is I want to get to know y'all more, okay? And as I look around the room, I know a few of you and you all are true servant leaders, the people that I know. So thank you for all that you do. Um, and so I think we've got something good going on here, which leads me to number two or three and four. So I also want to brag about Oak Cliff and Dallas, and you'll know more why, um, I think, here in a few minutes, but I'm still newer. My wife and I are still newer to Oak Cliff. We've lived here four years, and we've never lived in the city before, and it was a little bit intimidating when we were thinking about it, and then we had this thing called the pandemic, right, when we moved over here. And um, so now we talk about, my wife and I talk about when we're talking to people, we've never loved a neighborhood as much as we love Oak Cliff. So I want to brag about it, all right? And then lastly, um, I want to talk about what I think matters most, and I'm giving it away right here. I think culture, how we treat each other in our communities, in the places where we work matters the most. Uh, Marcy, my wife, is a lifelong elementary school teacher, but primarily kindergarten and first grade. And um, 
she, uh, these are the reasons she shouldn't have come today because I'm telling her all these, or I'm gonna tell you all these secrets, but in my office, is a pose or a uh, something hanging on my wall and it, it talks about just be kind and kindness and when she saw that in there with some of the other stuff i took out of her elementary classroom when we moved over here she's like oh you can do better than that this is not what a hospital president's office should look like right <laughs> but maybe that could be true but she never said that the kindness wall hanging was not okay that's important right and so i think culture community culture Wherever you work, whatever you do every day, wherever you go every day, whether it's here or somewhere else, I think that will make a difference. We can make Dallas better by building culture, and why not right here in Oak Cliff? Y'all got a way head start on doing that before I ever got here. So I think I want you to know what we're doing at Dallas and what I'm seeing you do in the community, okay? All right, so here we go. This is me. I feel like I need to move over here a little bit. Is that okay? Okay. All right. So I can see and then anyway. So that's me. Um, I don't know what I was thinking in that picture. I'm thinking it was something like this. All right. But I do know that if, that shirt, if I had that shirt in my closet today, it would go for a lot of money. Right. That is vintage. So, um, so don't, have, don't know where that is, but that's me. I grew up in rural Colorado. Del Norte, Colorado is where this uh, photo is taken. That's my grandfather. And this is proof that if uh, a fisherman ever says, hey, I caught a fish as long as my leg, I did, right? <laughs> so it's kind of a little hard to see, but those are fish. My grandfather, um, I'm on his right on this side. My brother, older brother's on the other side. It's a little hard to see, but he's holding two rainbow trout. And those trout are as long as my leg. And so that's how I grew up with my grandfather and my family in rural Colorado in the San Luis Valley. Um, this is my mom. So uh, she was teacher of the year in the San Luis Valley. So does anyone know where the San Luis Valley is? Alamosa, Colorado? You do? Okay. So South Central Colorado. It's a very rural, huge area. There's like Durango. People know Durango? Everyone knows where Durango is. Okay. So Durango is the southwest corner of Colorado. And then you have the Eastern Range. And then right in the middle of the state, almost in New Mexico is Alamosa. We're like 90 miles north of Taos. So a very rural area um, and a great place to grow up. So my mom, a hard worker, um, teacher of the year. Um, and that was one of my role models growing up is this is how I should be, is seeing my mom in the community and all that she did for that community. This is my dad. Um, my dad was a truck driver in Alamosa. He hauled cattle and produce and all the, primarily in the San Luis Valley up to Denver um, during the um, stock show season and then during the uh, slower times, produce all the way down to Las Cruces and El Paso, Texas. So um, just two really hardworking parents um, that I grew up with and, and had as role models. And I hope that's influenced me and and uh, truly servants, that's probably the other thing I should say is both of them in their own different ways, truly servants. My dad actually turned into run, owning and running the trucking business and he finally had to quit because, and sell it because he could not get himself off the truck. I mean, he was always driving, even though he ran and owned the business, nobody could do it like him, right? So he was out on the front lines all the time and I think that definitely impacted me and who I am. Wolf Creek Pass, uh, Wolf Creek Ski Area, it's a, uh, uh, another place close to where I grew up, a beautiful area. Uh, that's a photo taken from, you can kind of see the hood of my dad's truck, one of his trucks there in that picture on the left. And um, I just still have nightmares as a little kid driving with my dad over Wolf Creek Pass. I think was it John Denver sang the song Wolf Creek Pass way upon the Great Divide? Well, that's Wolf Creek Pass, okay? And then um, the, the Rio Grande River started in Alamosa, fun fact. So those mountains in the background, those are the Rocky Mountains, the uh, San Juan Range. So they, the river starts up there and then it ran right through Alamosa. And uh, my parents lived right across the uh, street from the Rio Grande River. When it got down to us, it's kind of the slow meandering river that we see in Texas as well. And then uh, the San Luis Valley is surrounded by 14,000 foot peaks. And so uh, this is Mount Blanco, one of the more famous peaks in Southern Colorado. And I actually climbed that with my brother one time and I will never do it again. Uh, <laughs> thought it was a, a life ending experience. <laughs> and then, uh, so this is fun. Um, so this is me in high school. So Alamosa, Colorado, 
I'm about six foot five. I was the tallest person within 200 miles, all right? <laughs> and so I played football. You played every sport. Anyone grow up in a small town? Okay, you do everything, right? It doesn't matter. I didn't know I had a choice to say no. Actually, I tried to say no to playing basketball, and my mom said, okay, that's great. Every day, right after school, you will come home and you'll have a list of chores. That lasted one day. The next day, I just went to basketball practice. Got home about 7 p.m. She says, where you been? I said, I joined the basketball team. And she's like, I thought so, right? Okay. So um, I played football and then, then basketball. That picture on the, the left of me, um, the, the story behind that, where I'm up in the rim, um, I was a junior and um, was, I was okay at basketball. I was tall, so that's why I was on the team, but I wasn't the best player. And so my junior year, we were playing up in Leadville, Colorado. Does anyone know where Leadville is? It's the highest incorporated city in the U.S., 10,000 feet above sea level. And um, we were playing in the conference tournament championship game. I did not play the entire game. Now, this was my junior year, all right? My senior year, I was incredible, all right? But my junior year, so didn't play the entire game. We're losing. We're playing the Buena Vista Demons. They had not been beaten all year, all right? And everybody on my team is getting tired. They file out. My coach has to put me in. I hit two free throws at the end of the game to win the game for us. Yeah, I heard a woo. Right, come on. I hit two free throws. All right. So that's the photo from the post-game celebration, the Valley Courier the next morning, headlines, right? And Alamosa wins. And then the first line of the article is something like, seldom used reserve, John Phillips. His, uh, What's the deal? Well, I, I just won. I, I mean, I, we went to state because of me. Seldom used reserve, all right? But it doesn't matter. You can be a seldom used re re reserve and still make a difference. And so since uh, my, my better sport was football, apparently, because I went on to play football, what brought me to Texas? I went to Abilene Christian University to play football. Um, and uh, so that's uh, Marcy right there, remember? So we met in college. Um, that's me and Marcy's brother, and he played football at Baylor. So I put this up there because I almost look as big as him. I'm really not, but I show this because I could have played at Baylor. I think. <laughs> and then I went on after college to go to UT Southwestern to become a physical therapist. Really still didn't know what I wanted to do with my life and used to drive by hospitals when I was um, in, well, probably my entire life, I don't know, some of you may be this way as well, where you go by a hospital and you're like, that's the last place I wanna go in, and that's the last place I would work. I don't know why, hospitals smell funny, they, you know, there's sick people there, why would I ever go in there? And um, I kind of felt that way even up to physical therapy school, and we were talking just a little bit earlier that my first clinical rotation at physical therapy school was at a inpatient rehab hospital on the neuro team, so I got to uh, take care of stroke and spinal cord injury patients and, and traumatic brain injury patients. And if you've ever had that moment in life, and I've had a few, one of them is coming to Oak Cliff where I'm like, well, I'm not going to like this. I'm not supposed to like this because I'm going to be the next physical therapist for the Dallas Cowboys. So there's no way I'm going to like taking care of neurological patients. And then after a while, you like it so much and you just keep hearing that voice over and over, this is what you're supposed to do, you just give up, right? And say, I'm gonna do this. So that's my story of getting myself into hospitals is uh, my first rotations in hospitals were in physical therapy and something about being in a hospital I just fell in love with. So I did physical therapy for 10 years. Marcy and I uh, got married my last year of physical therapy school and we had Mac, <coughs> Mac M-A-C, in Mali, um, they're about 22 months apart. Is that right? 21 months apart? Okay, so that's Mac and Molly. They've grown up some. Now, this isn't the most recent picture, but they have grown up. And so um, that's uh, Molly and Mac. They both went to the University of Texas. Mac, now, I have another picture of him in a minute. He uh, lives up in Pl uh, Carrollton and works in Plano. And Molly still goes to school down at the University of Texas. Um, Working as a physical therapist, um, I did that for 10 years in a hospital, not in Dallas, somewhere else in Texas, out in Abilene, Texas. And I got to see leaders, and I got to see hospital CEO, the hospital CEO there, and I got to see directors and managers and people that were leading people, and I thought, this is so awesome. I mean, look, the CEO of this hospital, he gets an amazing parking space right there. <laughs> 
in his, it says reserved for the CEO, and he comes and goes whenever he wants. I want to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to get that job. And so I went back and got my master's in business administration then, uh, uh, and my master's in healthcare administration in a little town um, in uh, west of Fort Worth, east of Abilene, called Eastland, Texas. They had a small, have a small hospital there. And they hired me as their um, hospital CEO. So that was my first move out of um, healthcare or out of physical therapy into hospital leadership, being the CEO of a hospital. What do you think that one of the first things I realized was? Now being the hospital CEO of a rural hospital. There's no parking no space. Parking. There's no parking space. <laughs> <laughs> There's no coming and going. There's going and never coming home. But that's okay. Um, well, it was okay with me. I don't know that it was okay with Marcy. Um, one of our life hacks that we learned there was, okay, if I'm going to keep doing this, we're going to live close to the hospital because then the coming and going isn't so hard. Uh, the one or two minute commute makes sense, right? Can make your day a whole lot more, more reasonable. So, um, and I laughed when I read this article because somewhere, if you can see it up there, it says, John Phillips comes to Eastland Memorial Hospital with six years of experience in healthcare administration. I've got to think the people of Eastland County were like, oh no, you're kidding me. That's it? That's all he has, right? <laughs> this kid looks like a baby. So um, we, that started my healthcare leadership journey. Um, went on ultimately to work for Christus Health, um, a Catholic healthcare organization um, in Texarkana up on the border of uh, Texas and Arkansas. And um, that's where I met um, Sister Damian Murphy. She's a nun at Krista St. Michael. She taught me a lot of things. This is one thing she taught me is do something, right? Um, when it's all said and done, a lot more is said than done. And that was super influential to me that at some point, you know, at the end of the day, we've got to get results. And as leaders, we should be leading by example and, and uh, showing people the way. Um, sister also, when I interviewed uh, for the job um, in a lot of Catholic hospitals, um, sisters are very influential. Has anyone ever worked at a Catholic hospital? Okay, so there was a CEO of the hospital. He essentially reported to sister. And so she was going to be very influential in if I got hired or not. And so when I was interviewing, one of the two times I interviewed, I said, sister, I am not Catholic. Is that okay? And she said, John, she was, she, I, she's Irish. And so when I tell this story, I'll try not to mimic her Irish accent. She said, John, do you not think we know that you're not Catholic? All right. said, okay, sister, just want to make sure. Just wanted to be clear and honest. I ended up getting the job. And my first day on the job as the chief operating officer of this hospital. And I reported to the CEO, and then we all reported to the sister. Um, my first day on the job, I walk in, I'm early, I'm waiting for someone to unlock the door, I get in my office, and I turn on the light, I put my stuff down, and I hear a voice behind me, I turn around, and there's sister standing there, and she has a gift for me. And she said, welcome. And she handed me the gift, and she walked out, and I pulled out the book, and it was the yellow, black cover book that said, Catholicism for Dummies. <laughs> I thought, we're gonna get along great. This is a perfect job. So sister also taught me resolve and get it done, but also humor. And then 12 years ago, I came to Methodist Health System. Uh, seven years I spent at Methodist Mansfield, south of Arlington, uh, as the president of that hospital. And then uh, five years ago, was asked to come to Methodist Dallas to be the president of our flagship hospital. So Methodist has um, seven, soon to be seven acute care full service hospitals like Methodist Dallas. Uh, Methodist Dallas is uh, really at our original site, our flagship hospital where we do all the cool stuff. And so that's why I wanted to be here at Methodist Dallas. So five years came here, five years ago I came here. And for one year, um, my kids were, my daughter had not finished high school. She was, she was finishing at Mansfield High. So I commuted for one year. Maybe the worst year of my life. I learned again, I am not a commuter. I'm like, what are all these people doing on the road every morning? And Marcy said, they're commuting just like you. <laughs> Quit complaining. But I had lived so close to hospitals all the time, I just realized this is not me. I want to live next to my hospital. So Molly, our daughter, graduated from Mansfield High. We looked at um, houses, found our house at Winneka in Colorado, 
right behind the Kessler Park, uh, First United Methodist uh, uh, Kessler Park Church, and uh, moved in there four years ago. And started exploring Oak Cliff, and never had lived in the city, um, a lot of different noises, a lot of I-30 traffic and other noises. Um, our dog was doing this all the time, you know, and so um, I would say six months, it was hard. It was an adjustment. And then I said, you know what? Um, I, there's a reason I'm here. And so let's go explore. And the pandemic started to hit sometime around this. And then I started finding things that you had done before I got here, I don't know, decades ago, maybe weeks before I got here, decades before I got here, I don't know. But this is a tour of a few things, a handful of things of what you've done and why I love Oak Cliff. Anyone know what this is? Where it might be? Combs Creek. Combs, Combs Creek Trail, right? It's where all the gnomes live. It's where all the gnomes live. You all seen the gnomes? <laughs> So are you learning something here? Has anyone not seen the gnomes? Okay, all right, so you go down to um, Colorado and Kessler Parkway. It's kind of where Stevens Golf Course is. There's a set of tennis courts, two city tennis courts, beautiful <laughs> tennis courts. I think people come from like McKinney to play on these tennis courts. They're wonderful, right? And if you go there, just walk about 100 yards either side and you'll see all kinds of gnome villages there, all right? really cool, and I think things like this make Oak Cliff special. People take the time to go to a hole in the tree, and there's a few trees that have blown over, the stumps are still there, and maybe places I would live before this, they would just rip out the stump, not here. We're gonna make a home, or the gnomes make a home for themselves, because they've gotta be real, all right? And I think they've gotta be good luck or something, all right? Um, this is my family, so a better picture, probably Marcy's a lot, feels better about the way Mac looks in this picture <laughs> versus his lion picture that I showed earlier. But this is us at the Oak Cliff Nature Preserve on a walk as a family. Um, and we're realizing, oh my goodness, there are wide open spaces right in the middle of Dallas we never knew existed. And another step closer um, to uh, making us love Dallas, this is my wife saying, I believe, well, my whole family says, everyone but me. Where is this? I don't know if it's still there. I think we rotate these out some. Is it still there? Bishop Arts, right? So um, just these unique things that we have done in our community to, to welcome people, to make people feel comfortable, to make people ask questions, to make people want to come back um, is part of our culture in South Dallas and in Oak Cliff. Um, I'd never ridden a bike before, so I guess I took that picture. We had sponsored a biking event when Mayor Rawlings was, um, so I was just proud of myself, I guess, I don't know. So that's me learning to ride a bike. And then this is, um, what is his name? Do you remember Lexi? Yeah. So he runs Love in Motion. Pollo. Pollo, right. And so that is there for two reasons. I love his hair, okay? So number one, I wish I had his hair, but I never will have his hair. And then Love in Motion um, is a nonprofit volunteer-led um, that we engaged pretty close right after I got to Methodist Dallas. So it wasn't my idea. But really what they do is go around the city and find people that need to be recognized. And um, so they came into my organization and helped me find ways to recognize our staff. Recon they are around recognizing educators, p uh, teachers in schools, school administrators, first responders. So just a, a, another step forward for me as I moved to Oak Cliff to see all the uh, special people and the culture of um, Oak Cliff and how appreciating each other makes us a better community as well. And uh, so this is Methodist, uh, one of the towers at Methodist Dallas. This is the Schinkel Tower and um, homework assignment. If you want to see the best views of the Dallas skyline, where do you go? You go to the Schinkel Tower, go to the Schinkel elevators, go up to the 11th floor. You can do this. There's no rules against doing this, okay? When the eleva elevators open, just walk to the little lobby right there, and this is what you'll see best views of Dallas. Now, you don't have to get admitted as a patient to do this, all right? 
We do have a few rooms in key areas in the Schinkel Tower that have this view, and uh, our patients rave about the view at night of, of South Dallas. And then um, this is a photo of some of our doctors and nurses that they took um, with me um, about a third of the way probably through the pandemic. And uh, so this is, this is moving into the uh, final objective of what makes Oak Cliff special and what we're doing at Methodist Dallas to continue to help make uh, Oak Cliff special. And I suggest to you all that this is what, these are some of the principles we do together to continue to make Oak Cliff the best place to live. So at Methodist Dallas, um, we have uh, some red rules, cultural red rules. And I define culture as the way things just happen in an organization. You can walk into an organization and you can feel a vibe or an energy. Have you ever done that? Like you go somewhere and you're like, this feels really good or something feels off here. Like if you ever go into a restaurant and if the people working in the restaurant in the lobby um, are, were arguing, how would you feel about the food? Probably not good, right? That would never happen to Jimmy's um, um, restaurant. You'll never, you'll never, see that never see that, right? <laughs> so um, it's important. Culture is important. How we treat each other is important. So our cultural red rules, um, and in healthcare, the term red rules is really about around patient safety. There are certain things that you do in in healthcare that are non-negotiables to make sure patients stay safe. So before a surgical procedure. There are certain things that always have to happen in a hospital to make sure the right surgery, right patient, right area the patient's gonna happen. That's a red rule. Never, ever, ever do you break that rule. Well, if we have those red rules, those types of rules in place for clinical care, and we take a step back and say, to provide the best clinical care, we need to have the best culture, the best environment, the best place for people to come and work because we want the best nurses, we want the best doctors, we want the best everybody to make sure that our patients get the best care. So if we have those clinical red rules, we should have those cultural red rules. So here's our four cultural red rules at Methodist Dallas, okay? So you can apply these to whatever you do every day or maybe you have a different twist on these that will fit what you do. Um, so uh, this is the, the universal sign for I am lost at a hospital. Have you ever seen this, okay? looking around. So whenever we see people in, in our organization that are lost, we go to them and say, can we help you find something? And when they say, yes, I'm looking for the emergency department, I'm looking for the cafeteria, what do you think we do? What's the best thing to do? Escort them there. Why, why is escorting better than pointing? Have you been escorted somewhere versus pointed somewhere? How, what, what's the difference? How do you feel escorted versus pointed? You know you're gonna get there, right? I totally, I, whenever I, if I were to ever tell someone where to go, really all I'm doing is handing them off to someone else because they're gonna get down the hall and still be lost. And it just creates, whenever I'm escorted somewhere, when I'm at Home Depot and I do not know where that light bulb is and they take me there, I'm coming back. And it just makes me feel different. It makes me feel better about that organization, okay? Um, number two, owners versus renters. So. Um, all of our team, we ask to be owners. And the, the primary thing is when we're walking around the hospital and we see anything on the floor, any trash, anything that is out of place, we pick it up and throw it away. That is not just housekeeping's job, that's all of our job. We all want to act like we own the place. Um, and sometimes, nothing against renters, right? But if you've ever rented something, I don't know, when you all VRBO or go to a hotel room, do you like clean it when you leave? My mom did, by the way, I'm a little warped by that, right? But she would make the beds before we left the hotel room. That is not normal, all right? I keep repeating to myself, that can't be normal. But when we're renting something, we often don't take care of it as we do, as like we do if we owned it, right? So that's a, a cultural red rule at our, our organization is always taking care of it like we own it. Um, iPhones and Androids, um, always staying off our personal cell phones whenever we're taking care of patients. We believe that if we're on our personal cell phones for whatever reason we're taking care of patients, that does not instill confidence in the patient. They probably think we're on TikTok or Instagram, so that is a non-starter at our hospital. 
And then lastly, I think it fell off my slide, is the 10-5 rule. So the, has anyone ever heard of the 10-5 rule? So during the pandemic, it was the 10-6 rule. So that's supposed to be a joke. Um, the, so the 10-5 rule is um, when you're walking down the hall and you get about 10 feet away from someone, okay, we make eye contact. And then when we get five feet away from someone, we always do what? We always speak. We always say something. Why do we do that? Why does that make a difference if you always do that in your community or where you work? You can pass people without speaking or you can always speak. What's the difference? Makes them feel welcome, right? Creates that environment, that warmth. There is a difference. So it's really easy to do, right? And um, we have, uh, we measure our patient satisfaction scores closely. And um, I continue to be surprised and very encouraged that oftentimes patients and their family members who often fill out the patient satisfaction surveys for the patients will comment on all of these red rules. People took me where I was supposed to go. People spoke to me. Everyone's so kind, everyone's so nice. That is the foundation. And a pandemic or some other crisis is not the time to start working on culture. You start working on culture now because tough times are going to come in all of our businesses and all of our lives at home. It's just normal, at least in my life that is. And if you have that solid foundation where you have your rules and they're non uh, non-negotiable rules because it's good for everybody and it creates a stronger culture and, a, and environment, you will thrive through those crises as opposed to stumbling through those crises. And I think that's what we're doing in Oak Cliff. I think we have that cultural foundation. And so really your homework assignment is to um, continue to do that in whatever you do every day so we keep seeing more people like you and like us and that want that same thing coming to Oak Cliff. And then lastly, I'll share with you, and this is what the best are doing. And I think we do a pretty good job of this in Oak Cliff, and we really work hard at this at Methodist Dallas. But um, a lot of research has gone into um, what the best organizations, the best communities are doing to have the strongest engagement. So this is really more from a, a staff engagement or medical staff engagement. Why do they love being at Methodist Dallas? Research would say these are the keys, support and confidence from us, from senior leadership, whatever your role is, whether it's you're leading your home, leading something in your church, leading your business, um, but people that report up to you or people that are around, to you, around you having confidence in you um, as a person of, of authority and leadership. So something that we do at Methodist Dallas is every day we start our morning seven days a week with a 30 minute huddle. Um, I call it safety huddle, and that's just a time where we all get together to understand what's going on today, what's happened in the past 24 hours, what do we anticipate in the next 24 hours, and that's really a time to connect with staff and top leadership um, to make sure that we're all communicating and instilling that sense of confidence in our staff. Um, recognition, Harvard Business School says recognition is the number one um, uh, thing that makes staff feel most appreciated and will keep staff, keep people who work for you um, in your organization. So uh, Lexi Helps leads our great celebration. So once a month, um, we do praise bombs and we have great celebrations to make sure that staff are getting that authentic, quick, real-time uh, uh, um, uh, recognition for great things that they're doing at the hospital. Um, respect and involvement, a, a key driver of staff engagement and a feeling of belonging is, is uh, frontline staff feeling respected. So we have unit-based councils at Methodist Dallas where every department has a small council made up of frontline staff only and they are in charge of helping lead their units um, at, at the unit level. And then that together, all those unit-based councils together continue to create a stronger culture at our hospital. And then the last two things are just reality. Whether it's the pandemic has made things different, I think pre-pandemic we still had job stress. Um, but really making sure that we're paying attention to the mental health of our staff as well and the people around us. So we've created serenity rooms where people can step aside for five minutes and just take a break. We also have these uh, 
or paid much more attention to families and visitors to the hospital also having those places of respite where they can go and just take a break and talk to someone and um, uh, catch their breath. And then lastly, um, getting a little bit better in healthcare, but uh, finding staff, finding people that want to come and engage and work has been really challenging the past two years. And culture is our strategic advantage, I think, as a community. And at our hospital, it's going to be our strategic advantage. So in the hardest of times, when it's difficult to find people, we want people to select us and our community, I would suggest, because this is the best place to be and the best, best place to live in Oak Cliff. And then uh, one of my um, mentors, he doesn't know, is Tony Dungy. He's a former uh, NFL coach of the Indianapolis Colts. May Colts. Maybe he was other places before there. But I like this. I like his saying. I won't read it to you all, but I tell our staff is um, a requirement at our hospital, and these are all good requirements, I think. So it's not asking um, a whole lot. It's more like um, helping people see our purpose is if you're ever having a bad day, and has anyone ever heard the saying, you know, when you come to work, leave your life at the door, right? Don't bring that into work. I think that's impossible, in my opinion. So people are gonna bring their personal lives to work. You can't leave it at the front door. And so my suggestion is when you come to work and you're having a bad day and those days are gonna happen, the magical pixie dust to fix a bad day is to go help somebody. And if you go help somebody, I don't know why it works this way, but you go help somebody, go take care of someone else's problem. Your problem doesn't mean your problem goes away, but for me at least, it helps my problem seem smaller. And I can put them aside for a while, and helping other people um, just makes me feel better. It fills that hole in me um, and helps my mental health. So I would rec suggest that we continue that in Oak Cliff as well. And uh, this community started doing these things decades ago, and, and uh, I think our responsibility is to continue that as we go forward in Oak Cliff. Thank you for having me today. We'd love to answer any questions that you might have. Let's give a round of applause. We have, we have a few